All right, let's begin with a prayer to the Blessed Mother, since we'll be talking about her tonight. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Mother of our Lord Jesus Christ, pray for us. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, so we finally get to a little bit of Mariology. And so if you look at it, uh, some of the topics of study, you have something like Christology, which is the study of Christ, or Ecclesiology, the study of the church, uh, Eschatology, the study of the la four last things, heaven, hell, uh, death, and judgment, Sacramentology, the study of the sacraments. There's all various fields of study when it comes to our faith. It's kind of like uh, the doctors have, uh, you know, you have your foot doctor, you have your, uh, your eyes, ears, and nose doctor, you have this, you know, you compartmentalize uh, the human body to specialize in particular fields, but every part of it affects the rest of the body, right? So um, uh, it's the same thing with when we're studying the, the body of theology, there's various areas of theology, but each one affects the other. We might study them in different compartments, but one thing's going to affect the other. So in other words, if we're studying Christology of Christ, it's going to lead us to talk about ecclesiology, the church, because Christ is the groom to the church. He founded the church, and so the two will mix, but yet the two separate areas of study. In the same time, we're talking about ecclesiology, we're talking about eschatology. Why? Because heaven... Everyone in heaven is Catholic. <laughs> Whether you get there, however you get there, you enter through those gates, the church is present in heaven, on earth, and in purgatory. Um, but it's also going to talk, deal with the um, salvation of souls. So eschatology, ecclesiology are going to mingle a bit. And then, of course, sacramentology be mixed in as well about the seven sacraments. And we're going to talk about the sacraments in future classes because we need to break down the seven sacraments and talk about our faith. But in all of it, too, we also talk about Mariology. Mariology is a particular field of study where we study the Blessed Mother. And because she is an incredibly important person in our salvation history. She's not merely an addendum to our salvation. Um, and that's part of the struggle we have with our Protestant brothers and sisters, is they see Mary as kind of like on the sidelines. As if she was just somebody God used. And I hate that phrase, God used me. Now, I understand it when we say it, God used me. In other words, it, there was this moment where God really, you know, His grace was present in me and through me, He did wonderful things. But the word, when it comes particularly to Mariology, I don't like used. Because God is love. And love doesn't use anybody. God is not a user, He's a lover. And so when God is using us, what's really happening is we're cooperating with grace with Him, doing wonderful things with the Lord, uh, for the Lord in this moment. And so Our Lady just wasn't used by God so that God could become man and then He kicks her to the curb like some sort of deadbeat dad. <laughs> you know, if you think about that type of mentality, that do we really believe in a God who used somebody simply to become man, and then kicks her to the curb, but she's no longer important. Is that the type of God we believe in? And the answer would be no. We don't believe in a God who uses somebody and throws them off to the side as if they're not important. So when we talk about Mariology, we're talking about somebody who is intimately related to each person of the Trinity in such a unique and beautiful way. She has a special relationship with each member of the Most Blessed Trinity, and we'll see some of that this evening. So when we say something about Jesus in theology, we automatically say something about Mary. I call it a theological tsunami. So if you, you know, a tsunami is, is a little shift under the water with an earthquake, and then all of a sudden there's a great tidal wave that happens miles away, like what happened in Indonesia not long ago. It was a one-foot shift in the plates under the, under the water, in the ocean, an er underwater earthquake, 
which sent that tremendous tidal wave which wiped out those beaches. When we say something about Jesus, it creates a tidal wave of theology. It has incredible effects. For example, if you say Jesus is God, you've just created a tsunami. In other words, there's effects to that. So if Jesus is God, then Mary gave birth to God, therefore you can call her Mother of God. Now, you'll have Baptists say, oh no, you can't call her Mother of God. But the church back in the fourth century said, no, because he is God, she gave birth to a person, not merely to a nature, you can call her Mother of God. It had that tsunami effect. Now, if she is Mother of God and God's going to become man through her, God can't enter anything unholy. So if Mary then is going to be Mother of God, well then she needs to be without sin. And we work back to the Immaculate Conception. So now we have another doctrine of Our Lady. From Mother of God, we go back to the Immaculate Conception. To be the Mother of God, she needs to be conceived without sin so God can actually enter and take from her a sacred humanity by which he could redeem the world with. Now if you call her the Immaculate Conception, now you're speaking about somebody who has the fullness of all graces, and if she has the fullness of all graces, well then she's capable of obtaining graces for others, because she's not in the state of original sin. So, I'm getting way ahead of myself here, but <laughs> I think you get what I, the idea that once you say one thing, you start a cascade of truths that we begin to speak about the Blessed Mother, what I call my theological tsunami. So you may say something simple as Jesus is God, and you wind up calling Mary co-redemptrix, this great big theological term, which hopefully we'll explain, um, which says a lot about who she is, okay? So Mary is not an afterthought of God. It wasn't God, like God said, okay, Adam and Eve sinned, now gosh darn it, I gotta become man and save them. Let me go find some woman to do this through. As if she's an afterthought. A secondary thought on God's part. God doesn't work that way. Because remember, we, talk, we go back to that first class on God, and we talk about God being good, God being holy, God being unchanging. So there's another tsunami, because that word unchanging. God is immutable. He doesn't change. That means when God creates something, there's a plan in which that's in effect, he doesn't change it, okay? He's immutable the way he works. Um, so he's not, so Mary's not an afterthought. So I need to back up and talk about Mariology. We need to talk about this thing called the primacy of Christ. Okay, the primacy of Christ. This goes back to what St. Paul talks about. St. Paul, when speaking about our Lord Jesus Christ, he says, all was created through Him. All was created for Him. He is before all else that is. That primacy of Christ. All was created through Him. All was created for Him. When St. Paul is thinking of creation, he's basically telling us when God decided to create, God decided that He would become man. All was created for the Incarnation. All was created for God to become man, so that God could sum all things up in Himself and give glory back to the Father. There's this great going forth and the coming back. God creates so He can become man, and becoming man, He can then offer to His Father the greatest glory. And so if it's true what St. Paul says, that all was created for Him, for the Incarnation, and love, God is love and love seeks union, that God was always going to become man through a woman. She wasn't an afterthought. Even if Adam and Eve had not sinned, Our Lady would have been born, conceived without sin, and God would become man through her in order to draw all creation into Himself to bring all to the glory of the Father. She was always intended by God. Now, there's a school thought said, well, we don't really know what God would do because it didn't happen that way, so it's all kind of speculative thinking. And the answer to that is no, it's not speculative thinking, it really is looking at the truth of who God is. 
If God is love, which we know He is, then love seeks union, then God always wanted union with us. And if God always wanted union with us, that means He always wanted to become man, even if Adam and Eve haven't sinned. Because love would dictate that. If He truly loved us before the fall, then before the fall of Adam and Eve, He always wanted that union with us, and so He was always going to become man, and always do so through this woman, so that all of humanity could be glorified. All of humanity could receive the adoption as children of God. All of us can receive that. Now, Jesus would not have had to die on the cross if Adam and Eve had not sinned, because there'd be no sin to make reparation for, no sin to offer himself for. But we would have been given the grace through the incarnation to receive that adoption as children of God. Does that make sense? So you see, it's not a Mary's not an afterthought. She's part of the first thought of the incarnation. At the very first thought of God becoming man, God has the same equal thought of his mother. She is not an afterthought, she's a co-thought, we could say, equal to that thought of him becoming man. So God always intended to become man, even if Adam and Eve hadn't sinned. It's not a mere proposition of possibilities that did not happen. It goes to the very nature of God. To the very nature of God. As I said, it was like God said, oops, Adam and Eve sinned, I guess. Let's see, what should I do? I got an idea, let's become man and save them. Go find me a woman, Gabriel. <laughs> you know, as if this was some afterthought. Now, did God know that we would sin when he created us because he's all-knowing? Yes. So did he have the remedy already ready? Yes, which is really beautiful if you think about it. I think it was St. John Paul II who said, when God chose to create, God chose to suffer. He chose the cross the moment he chose to, say, to create. Before he said, let there be light, he already knew that he would give his life for us. Which is really beautiful when you think about the reality that Christ was willing to endure every bit of suffering even before he spoke the words, let there be light. So much did he love us. That in creating us, for knowing we would sin, he was ready to give his life for us. And offer himself in sacrifice that we could have life and have it to the full. So by incarnation, God the Son would give praise, honor, and glory to the Father on behalf of all creation. And through him man would be glorified and in fact divinized. We talk about being divinized. What does that mean, being divinized? It means we get to share in the fullness of God's divinity, in the glory of heaven. Or as some of the fathers of the church said, God became man that man might become divine. God enters into our humanity, embraces us, gives us that state of grace, draws us into himself so that we can actually enter into the glory of the kingdom of heaven and have union with God. You think about Jesus' words at the Last Supper. Father, may they be one. I in them, you in me, that they may be one with us. He has this desire for us that we should share in His divinity in the glory of the kingdom of heaven. So in heaven, we're not just like sitting back on beach chairs, drinking a beer, going like, this is so cool, the beatific vision. You know, it's not just like this show that we're watching. It's a full participation in the very life of God. We don't lose who we are. We don't cease to be ourselves because we're still us. But yet we're fully sharing the fullness of the divine life in God, the glory of heaven. Or as Jesus said, Father, I have given them the glory that you gave me. In this we speak about in a personal way, the Holy Spirit Himself, but also the fullness of what He has is bestowed upon us. So, since God is immutable, unchanging, He would have always intended the incarnation to take place through the woman. 
He always intended to become man through the woman. I use the word the woman for a reason, because there's several times in scriptures we hear the word the woman. The first time we hear it is in Genesis 3.15 when God says to Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and hers, you will strike her to heel and she will crush your head. The second time we'll hear of the woman will be uh, at the wedding feast of Cana when our Lord Lady tells our Lord that they're out of wine. He says, woman, how is this to you and I? He's not calling his mother woman because he's trying to be disrespectful. He's using the word woman because he's relating her back to the woman of Genesis. The second time, third time it's used is when Jesus is hanging on the cross and he says to his mother about John, woman, behold your son, and then to the John, behold your mother. But again, from the cross, he calls her woman, again, relating her back to the woman of Genesis. This is the woman who crushes the head of Lucifer. This is the new woman. This is the woman who will be the true mother of all the living, the new Eve. And then the next time we hear about it is in Galatians chapter 4 by St. Paul. St. Paul will say, um, he was born under the law. How, did, how exactly did you put it? How did you put it over here? Uh, where do I have it written down? I had it written down. Uh, yes, he says, he was born of the woman, under the law, to deliver from the law those who are subject to it. But he specifically doesn't say Mary's name, he calls her the woman. Because he's relating her once again back to Genesis. And then the last time we speak of the woman is when we see in Revelation chapter 12, the woman clothed with the sun, standing on the moon, crowned with 12 stars, and she gives birth and so forth, and the war breaks out in heaven. So we have these various moments throughout Scripture, beginning in Genesis, ending with Revelation, and all these moments in between of this woman who has this amazing relationship with God, who has authority even with God, like telling him to work a miracle, <laughs> through whom God blesses the world. Okay? So he always intended the woman, not an afterthought. I keep re reinforcing that. So, hence Mary was always intended by the Trinity. Or as Archbishop Bishop Ful take two, Archbishop Fulton Sheen called her, the world's first love. The world's first love. Mary has this unique relationship with the Trinity. Right? So, I, I feel like, I, am I repeating myself from earlier classes? I hope it's, it's all like coming together here. So, let's go back to that moment when God, in all of eternity, whenever this happens in eternity, there's no time in eternity, so it's hard to give a time to it. But at whatever moment, God decided he was going to create. God knew at that moment that he would become man. He knew he would do so through a woman. So at that moment of the decision of the incarnation, there's also the decision of Our Lady. She is the first woman, full human person, we could say, that he thought of. And so when the Father thinks of her, it's his most beloved daughter, his greatest of creations, his most beloved daughter. When the Holy Spirit speaks of her and contemplates her, he sees her as his most beloved spouse, to whom he is going to wed himself to and be one with from the moment of her conception. She's his spouse. And our Lord Jesus Christ, immediately, the God, the Son, the second person of the Trinity, thinks of my mother. She holds this unique relationship with each member of the Trinity, even before she's created. At the very thought of her, God the Father beholds his daughter. God the Holy Spirit, his spouse, and God the Son, his mother. I think this is so important when we talk about the dignity and vocation of women. Is that God upholds women in such a high regard that the first love of humanity was a woman. 
we go back to that class, I think I told our creation, I think I said God creates in order of perfection, right? Everything's getting more perfect as time goes on. Then he creates Adam and says, I can do better, right? <laughs> and the perfection of man is woman, which is the last thing he creates as the high point of his creation, right? So she's the last that he creates, but she's the height of his creation. And so we often say in theology, we say what is last in what is first in intention is last in execution. What is first in intention is last in execution. In other words, the first thing God intended, He does last. He brings it to its perfection. And so even though Our Lady was the first intended, she becomes the high point of, of all creatures. Now, Jesus becomes man through her. He does take upon a full human nature from her, but he's a divine person, not a human person. She's fully human. He's fully human and he's fully divine. He's both and, right? So his human nature is fully perfect, his human soul and so forth, but he's a divine person. She's a full human person, and so she is the greatest of all his creatures in that sense that aren't God. Okay? So, um, so I think, yeah, I mentioned that last phrase that's there. Is that, everybody a catch all that? Like, you understand why we, when we talk about the Blessed Virgin Mary, we're not just talking about some afterthought of God. We're talking about some who God always intended to be. He always was going to become man through her. And as we look at Scripture and we go from the book of Genesis forward, what we find continuously on every page of Scripture, St. Bonaventure says, we find the Blessed Mother. St. Bonaventure said, if you can't find the Blessed Mother on every page of Scripture, you don't know the Bible well enough. Because she's always, just as Christ is always being prefigured, so she is being prefigured. Just as God, Christ is being foreshadowed and the redemption is being foreshadowed, so Our Lady is always being foreshadowed in the Old Testament. And just as there are prophecies of Christ, prophecies of the Church, prophecies of our redemption, prophecies of our salvation, there's throughout the Old Testament prophecies of Our Lady and her role in our redemption. And so we turn over to this board over here. So I mentioned this phrase here, what is first in, it, in intention is second in execution. Mary is prophesied and prefigured throughout the entire Old Testament. And Mary is a key and central person in the New Testament. All right, we can look at a lot of the, I mean, we'll take a look at some of those Old Testament prophecies in the Old Testament, but we have to see her also as a key figure in the New Testament. The Gospel of both Matthew and Luke begin by talking about Our Lady. Matthew will give us the lineage of Jesus through St. Joseph, because as I mentioned in earlier classes, Matthew is very concerned about making sure that we know that Jesus is in the royal line of David and he's fulfilling all the prophecies as prescribed for the Jewish people. Being a Jew, that's his concern. And so he's, he'll talk about Joseph, but he'll mention how Our Lady conceived our Lord through the power of the Holy Spirit, and then Joseph uh, uh, you know, accepts uh, this. Luke, on the other hand, he's, he's all about Our Lady. <laughs> you know, he's, he's always talking about Our Lady. And we see her as a key and central person throughout uh, the scriptures, the gospels. And even in the early church, she specifically mentioned to be there on Pentecost Sunday. That she is in the upper room with the apostles. Just as she was pregnant with our Lord for nine months and gave birth to the head of the church, so she's with the apostles for nine days and gives birth to the body of Christ the church. So, um, who is it? Uh, uh, in the Second Vatican Council, they asked the bishops, I think, it's, I think Fulton Sheen tells the story, of whether or not they can call Mary the mother of the church. And a bunch of them wrote back saying, well, she's the mother of the head of the church, but could you call the mother of the church? And uh, Paul VI responds as well, if she gave birth to the head, she gave birth to the body. <laughs> and so it's one, you know. And uh, they declared that Our Lady Mother of the Church, because she is the mother of the head, Christ himself, and of us. She gave birth to Christ on Bethlehem and to the church in the upper room on, um, on Pentecost Sunday. 
Uh, St. Uh, Bernard of Clairvaux, he calls Our Lady the neck of the church. The neck. She connects the head to the body. But he also speaks about how everything from the head flows through the neck to the body, everything from the body flows from the neck back to the head, which we'll get into later talking about Mariology uh, and what, how he put it back in the uh, 11th century when he spoke about Our Lady as the neck of the church, right? But she's a key figure in the uh, Acts of the Apostles. And I'm going to go back to a lot of this. This is kind of just starting just with an overview right now. And I'm going to go back to a lot here. So I want to put down some uh, what would be key Marian doctrines. And, to look, and we're, going to look, we're going to look at all of these. So this is a re kind of review uh, or preview to what's coming. The first is the Immaculate Conception. This is a dogma of the church. It's not an option to believe in. We must believe this dogma of the church. The church always believed this, but struggled with how it happened and how to actually figure it out. A lot of times it was the science that made it very difficult about conception. Until they finally figured out the science <laughs> of conception, um, it was solemnly declared as a dogma of the church in 1854, solemnly defined. And it goes back to the scriptural reference of the woman that has enmity with Satan. Enmity means total separation, no control, no power, no authority, nothing. Which is why we know that Our Lady was never in the state of sin because it was prophesied that she would have enmity. Satan would never have any control over her. So for this to be true, she could not have been conceived in sin. Not at any moment in her life could she have been with sin if she was to have enmity with Satan. He has no authority over her. He has no say over her. He never had control over her. He has nothing he can do against her. Because he never, for one moment, did he have anything of any power over her whatsoever. So she has enmity with Satan. The other phrase we have is from the Gospel of Luke. When the angel Gabriel comes to her and says, Hail, full of grace. From saying this right in Greek, kekere to many. Which means, there's nothing lacking in you. You have the fullness of all God's graces. For her to have the fullness of all graces, she needs to be in the state of perfect grace. With no sin. Remember, when Adam and Eve fell, the, the great picture of uh, the painting of... Um, Michelangelo, where you have uh, the center of the Sistine Chapel, God the Father's finger coming up, and then Adam's finger drops. You know, he, he fell into sin, his finger drops. So all of us lost that divine touch because of our first father. Mary always had that touch. And more than that. <laughs> she had far more than the touch. And so she was full of every grace. She had more than just the state of original justice of our first parents, more than just the state of grace that you and I have. To say she was full of grace means she had all seven gifts of the Holy Spirit at work in her. It means that she had all the graces of faith, hope, charity, all the grace of prudence, temperance, justice, um, and the other one, <laughs> all the seven virtues, right? She had every grace. There was nothing lacking in her. For that to be true, she had to be conceived without original sin. There could be no sin in her to have the fullness of graces. You and I have been baptized into Christ Jesus. We have received the state of grace. But do I have the fullness of graces? Mm, i got quite a few lacking. <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm building up to it. I still have sin at work within me, as St. Paul says of himself. Right? We're all fighting those, those temptations and so forth. We have that inclination to sin. That was not present within her, for her to be full of grace. The second uh, theological truth about Our Lady that cannot be denied, that is to be believed, is her perpetual virginity. This was decreed by the Church in 647 AD, that's a long time ago, at the um, Vatican Synod, that Mary uh, was a virgin before, during, after the birth of Christ. She did not have relations after Jesus was born, nor before. And even the birth of Christ, her virginal um, physical, was, was kept intact. 
We don't ask too many questions about this and respect for what we would call um, just being prudent and being uh, chaste in our conversation, but also respectful. We say that she was a perpetual virgin, before, during, and after. Okay? It's a miracle of birth, with Our Lady giving birth and yet maintaining her virginal integrity. So this goes back to the prophecy of Isaiah. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son and name him Emmanuel. This was the sign given to King Ahaz. And so it was prophesied that it will be the virgin that conceives and bear a son. When the scripture uses phrases like the Mary was a virgin until she bore, it doesn't mean after she bore a son then her and Joseph had regular relations. It, the word until is used simply to mean that um, there was basically that she gave birth to a son. It was more of a timing thing than about she had after relations afterwards. She herself declares, I do not know man, and asks how this is going to happen. This becomes a distinction between how um, when uh, John the Baptist's father gets in trouble and Mary doesn't. John the Baptist's father asks questions and Mary asks questions. And Zechariah gets in trouble and Mary doesn't get in trouble. Because Zechariah doubted that God could give a child to his wife Elizabeth in her old age. You know, there's plenty of proof in the Old Testament that that could happen. Mary is asking about the mechanics of this. How is this going to be? I do not know man. Right? Which is why we know that Our Lady was also going to be in a virginal marriage. In the book of Deuteronomy, going back to the time of Moses, there was a practice where a woman would enter into a virginal marriage, where she would consecrate herself to God, and yet she would be married as a way of taking care of her, but it would be a chaste marriage. Mary was entering into this type of marriage from the book of Deuteronomy, Otherwise, this question would make no sense if she was not going to be, right? If she was planning to have regular relations with Joseph, it would be a non-question to ask, how can this be, I do not know man, right? But because she was entering into that virginal marriage, which we find in the book of Deuteronomy, of women who would practice this, and it was happening even more at the time of Christ, and even more women were doing this because there was an expectation of the coming of the Messiah, this was the beginning of Jewish monasteries prior to Christian monasteries. There was Jews living, uh, Jewish Pharisees living in monastic life in expectation of the Messiah because everyone was doing the, the math from the book of Daniel, knowing that he was coming soon. It's a very popular thing to do at the time, but this is how we know that Mary was planning to remain a virgin um, even during her marriage with Joseph. Okay? The third the theological truth we speak about Our Lady, undeniable, it's a divine maternity. Another way of saying mother of God. <laughs> she is God's mother. She gave birth to God. Um, the phrase from the book of Isaiah, they shall call him Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Right? God with us. It's prophesied, and then the angel says it to both to Our Lady and to St. Joseph. When Gabriel speaks to Our Lady, he'll say, the child shall be born, shall be called Son of God. So it's very clear that Mary is mother of God. It's the third theological truth of Our Lady that cannot be denied. Okay, it's part of the articles of our faith. That she was conceived without the state of original sin and never entered into sin. She remained a virgin before, during, and after the birth of Christ. She became the mother of God. And then fourth, she became the mother of us all. Her universal motherhood. This we get from the Psalm 45, which is a beautiful psalm, and I'm not wearing my glasses, so I apologize. Um, but in the Psalm 45, we have the prophecy of Our Lady, where it speaks about this woman. Instead of your fathers shall be your sons, you will make them princes over all the earth. That she's going to become the mother of her ancestors. Figure that one out. How does she become the mother of her ancestors? Right? And she becomes the mother of us all. And Jesus himself will make this proclamation from Calvary when he says to her, Behold your son. Right? And it's interesting because when John writes his gospel, John's a little bit of a, you know, 
Having been the teenager at the time of our Lord's life, he was 13 years old when he started following our Lord. He was 16 years old at the crucifixion, and he lived into his late 80s. John was the only of the 12 apostles not to be martyred. So you know how all the apostles were always fighting over who was most important? Well, John, being the last guy to write his gospel, got the last word. And the disciple whom Jesus loved. <laughs> you know, like he just gets that last word in there, you know? He calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved, you know? Now, I don't think he's doing it to be a wise guy and get the last word in. He was doing it because as he reflected upon his life, there were particular things that John did that John sees that he was somewhat of a a foreshadowing or an example of what a beloved disciple does. A beloved disciple leaves everything to follow Christ. A beloved disciple believes that Jesus, that Jesus is God. A beloved disciple, when Jesus is in agony, lays his head against the heart of Christ. A beloved disciple doesn't leave our Lord in his persecution, but then the beloved disciple actually goes to the foot of the cross. The beloved disciple takes Mary into his home. The beloved disciple always follows Peter, and the beloved disciple always subjects his own opinion or his own um, knowledge to that of the church. I say that because that's when Peter was on the boat. They're all fishing, and Jesus is risen from the dead. He's cooking some fish on the shore, and our Lord tells him to throw the nets off the other side, and John knows it's our Lord. Nobody else does, and John says to Peter, it's the Lord. He subjects his own uh, thought to Peter, the head of the church, who then jumps in the water and swims ahead of the boat, and the boat comes in behind Peter. John stays in the boat, and the boat follows Peter. But I guess that's another story for another day, John. But the key point here is that John represents all of us at the foot of Calvary. So when Jesus says from the cross, Behold your mother, everyone receives a mother. Jesus also said at the Last Supper, I will not leave you orphans, and he didn't. He gave us his father to be our father, he gave us his mother to be our mother. And we think about the beautiful reality, if we are baptized into Christ Jesus, and Jesus has become our brother, then if he is our brother and we have been adopted, then his father is our father, his mother is our mother. And so she has her role as the universal mother of all humanity, the new Eve. She becomes the mother of all the living. And this is so beautiful when we even think about outside of Scripture, post-resurrection, and Our Lady's apparitions over the centuries. When she shows up in Guadalupe, how does she look? She looks like one of the Aztecs. When she shows up in... Um, uh, not Honduras, but near Honduras. She looks half uh, indigenous, half Spanish, both races. She can appear with the races of the people to whom she comes to identify with them as their mother. And so beautifully when she says to Juan Diego, I who am here, am I not your mother? Is there anything else that you need? Are you not here in the crossing of my arms? So beautifully, Our Lady speaks to Juan Diego about her motherhood. So, one of our doctrines of the faith, our fourth, is her universal motherhood. That she is mother of us all. The fifth doctrine is Mary's assumption into heaven. She is taking body and soul into the glory of heaven. Now, this is not in Scripture per se. There are prophecies of this in Scripture. For example, Psalm 45, forget your own people in your father's house, so has the Lord desired your beauty. There's also the prophecy of he will not allow his beloved to undergo corruption. But we also have to think of it in terms of relationship. Well, actually, let's back up a little bit. If she is the immaculate conception, that means she was not subject to original sin, therefore it's not subject to corruption. But then you think of it in terms of relationship. Would God the Holy Spirit allow His spouse to be corrupted? Would God the Father allow His most beloved daughter, whose first thought to be corrupted into human dirt? 
would God the Son allow his mother to undergo corruption? She is the first to receive the glory of the assumption and the, the, the we could say, the, the, the resurrection from the dead, of the, of, other than Christ himself, right? To receive the beauty of being resurrected by Christ and assumed into heaven, body and soul. I kind of think of it on these terms, on real human terms, and I'm probably not speaking theologically here, but more emotionally. I'm sure Jesus knew that his mother just wanted to hug him one more time with her own arms, with the same body that gave birth to him. And you think about the sacredness of her body. The sacredness of her body. Being the immaculate conception of no sin in her, but she was also the temple of the Most High God. What we know to be the temple of God was merely a foreshadowing of her. The temple of Jerusalem was merely a prefigurement of Our Lady. When the Shekinah glory, the cloud would come down over the Holy of Holies, that was a prefigurement of her whom the Holy Spirit had come upon and stayed with her. When God was born of her, Truly, Christ was no longer in her, but the Holy Spirit remained with her. She remained the temple of God even after the birth of Christ because of the presence of the Holy Spirit with her. She didn't cease to be the temple of God after Christ was born. I, I don't know if I told you that. I've had who I told this story to the other day. And I, well, I must have gave it on a retreat not long ago, but St. Lawrence of Brindisi was uh, arguing with a fellow who was a Protestant, it's the 16th century, and he was saying that you can't call Mary, um, that she wasn't that important after the birth of Christ. Once Christ had been born of her, she no longer had value. This was this guy's argument. Now, this fella, um, I, don't know how to, I, I gotta look it up to find that his exact name, but the translation of his name is Poophead. <laughs> because somehow he pooped in the baptismal font, that became his nickname. So, <laughs> Lawrence of Radizzi begins to argue with this fellow. In a homily, a public homily, he says, you are well-named poophead <laughs> because you don't know what you're talking about. And he speaks about the fact that even though Mary gave birth to Jesus, she maintained her value because the Holy Spirit remained with her. He was using the argument, well, if you take money out of the purse, the purse no longer has that value because the money's out of the purse. That's what the real value was. And Lawrence of Brindisi was basically saying, no, it wasn't just Christ who was in her and with her, but the Holy Spirit who was with her and in her at all times, because he was wedded to her and one with her. So it wasn't just the removal of, of Christ from her, and that was not just her value, it was simply in being a vessel of God, being used by God, but because of her relationship to each member of the Trinity, she had value and she had worth beyond measure. And so when you think about Mary, in a, even in her physical body, the value of that, God would not allow that body to undergo corruption. She was sacred to the Lord. Truly the holiest of holies. Even if you just look at only her relationship with Christ. He grew within her. She gave birth to him. She nursed him. She held him. She sang to him. It was in her eyes that he knew the love of a mother. He slept in her arms. He rested on her lap. She, I'm sure, you know, bandaged his little scraped knees when he fell as a baby in a child. How often she kissed the face of God. It wasn't just simply this, okay, here's Jesus, I'm, I'm out of here now. No, I just said somehow you just put away and done. There's a physical relationship, and that physical relate, that close contact with Christ Jesus in the unity that they have. Remember, he took his sacred humanity from her humanity. It wasn't created from nothing, it was from her humanity. And so God reverences that humanity of hers and it is resurrected, immediately assumed into the glory of the kingdom of heaven. Death, destruction, not touching her. 
because he loved her that much and she was that important to the salvation of humanity. Number six is her coronation of Queen of Heaven and Earth. You know, this is prophesied um, in Solomon, King Solomon. Uh, King David has a son, and, um, you know, his, he has various sons. They're all kind of vying for the throne. And then uh, the prophet comes to Queen Sheba, uh, Bathsheba, and says, Hey, didn't uh, David promise the throne to your son, Solomon? She's like, Yes. Well, you know, his stepbrother's over there trying to get the throne right now, his half-brother. And so they devise this little thing, and Bathsheba goes to see King David and secures the throne for Solomon. The mother secured the throne for her son. David takes Solomon, puts him on his donkey, sends him into Jerusalem riding on the donkey. Everyone's yelling, screaming out, all hail, son of David. Sound familiar? Hosanna to the son of David. Got a little repetition there. Solomon comes in, he takes the throne of his father. After being crowned king, he takes the throne, pulls it over next to his at his right side, and sits his mother down as queen and declares her queen of Jerusalem. Which is why the Jews never had their wives as queens, but always their mothers as queens. Hence the term the queen mother. Right? So, I mean, Solomon did have 300 wives and 700 concubines. Which one would you choose? Ha! Mom. <laughs> That'll solve that argument. <laughs> right? But he crowns his mother as queen and says to her, Ask whatever you will and it shall be done for you. Ask whatever you will. So this act is a prefigurement of Christ, the true king of Israel, who crowns his mother queen of heaven and earth. Now, we see this prophesied in the Old Testament, but we see this beautifully shown in the book of Revelation. Our book, chapter 12, Our Lady is shown standing on the moon, clothed in the sun, crowned with 12 stars, pregnant with child. She's crowned queen of all creation. Now, Lucifer rejects this and so forth, but she is the queen of all creation. Another great example of her queenship and her advocacy is Queen Esther, a girl who's raised up to be the queen, and then from her place as queen, she affects the salvation of her people. In Queen Esther, the story of Queen Esther. So there is many, many prophecies and prefigurements of the queen who would come, who would intercede for her people, and truly be the queen mother of us all. And there's also the showing of her as queen in the book of Revelation, that she is queen. St. Lawrence of Brindisi also makes the remark that whenever God shows himself in glory in the Old Testament, it's always beautiful and incredible, but not as beautiful as he shows Mary in the book of Revelation, clothed in the sun, crowned with 12 stars, standing on the moon, this beautiful figure that is shown of Our Lady in this beautiful arraignment. And he says, well, Every king wants to see his queen beautifully adored and loved by the people. <laughs> and he said, this is the God just adorning his queen, you know, and showing off his queen and all of her beauty. So, so Our Lady as crowned. That's a, this is a dogma of our faith, a coronation. So these are aspects of Our Lady, of our faith, that are defined dogmas. Uh, these two, the Immaculate Conception and her Assumption, would define extraordinarily by the keys of Peter, when the Pope says, um, from the throne of Peter ex cathedra, these were, they were always believed, but they were defined um, in an extraordinary way, where the rest is ordinary teaching of the church. In other words, the past 2,000 years the church has taught us. Finally, the seventh is kind of a mixture of various things, which all fall into a same type of uh, our Lady's ministry in the church. She is advocate. She advocates for her children. She's always interceding for us. Right? She's distributrix. Meanwhile, she distributes graces to souls. So, as you mentioned, God is immutable. God always works the same way. So Christ comes to us through Our Lady 
The Holy Spirit comes to us through Our Lady at Pentecost in the upper room, so every grace comes to us through Our Lady. She distributes every grace. No matter what grace it is to whom it goes, it goes through the hands of Our Lady. The Holy Spirit always works through her. She's the neck of the church. Everything flows from the head through the neck to the body. So we talk about Our Lady as distributrix. We think of her role as the neck, connecting the head of the body. Everything flows through her to the church. We call her mediatrix. She mediates every grace. Um, it's kind of like a fountain. You turn the fountain on, all the water is coming through that fountain. The water is, is, is from the well, right? It's the grace of God that flows to us, but it's mediated through that fountain. Our Lady is the fountain by which every grace is mediated. This last one here, again, I'm going to flush these out over time, so <laughs> I don't want to give it a big overview. This last one here has a lot of controversy in the present day and age because of a lack of understanding of Mariology and understanding of the Immaculate Conception. The dogma of the Immaculate Conception is intimately connected to that word co-redemptrix. That Mary assisted in our redemption. She co-redeemed. With Christ, she redeemed us. Now, we don't mean when we say co-redemption equal to Christ, but under Christ. Just as in the fall of humanity, it was principally Adam that brought us down, but not without the help of Eve. Eve assisted, she was the co-faller, we could say, where Adam was the primary faller. It was his fault that we fell, but not without her assistance. In the way of redemption, it is Christ who is the Redeemer, but He does so not without the assistance of Our Lady. Did He need her? No. Did He want her? Yes. And that's the way He ordered it to be, so that He would do the reversal of our fall by having a woman participate in the redemption. And we can go through various ways she did this. But most importantly, when we speak of co-redemption, we mean because Our Lady did not have original sin. She had friendship with God, unlike us with the broken friendship. She alone had the ability to obtain grace for others because of her relationship with God. She was in a relationship where, in, with God where she could offer her sufferings in union with Christ and obtain grace for souls. Just as you and I do now in the state of grace, you and I, when we do penance, we can offer and unite our sufferings to those of Christ and obtain grace for souls. Our Lady, in a preeminent way, was able to do so because she was the Immaculate Conception. And her relationship to the Holy Spirit, as spouse of the Spirit, as daughter of the Father, as mother of the Son, she was also able to unite her sufferings to Christ to offer them to the Father. And what's interesting, what is her suffering other than that of the crucifixion itself? Christ is offering himself to us as the primary redeemer, offering himself to the Father for us and for our salvation. Our Lady's suffering is that of Christ. She's offering to the Father the same offering as God the Son on the altar of her heart. He's offering himself on the altar of the cross. She's offering Christ on the altar of her heart for our redemption. Again, not equal to Christ, but under Christ. This is what makes her also the queen of martyrs. Because every martyr will look to the cross for strength in their suffering for Christ. The crucifixion is actually the source of Our Lady's sufferings. It's the source of her martyrdom, we could say. So I hope this makes sense to you as I'm trying to explain that she's not, like a co-pilot means he's second in charge, the co-pilot. He's not equal to the pilot, he's under the pilot. Our Lady co-redeems in the fact that she's offering to the Father the same sacrifice of Christ the Son to the Father for us and for our salvation. This beautiful reality that she is co-redeeming, assisting in our redemption. So the seventh one here is a bunch of conglomerations of, of various titles we give Our Lady as 
advocate, distributrix, mediatrix, corredemptrix. Each of them can be unpacked, and there's a lot of theology to each of them, those titles, but they're all interrelated with the other various things we already said about her. Okay? So on the last note, I realize I'm getting uh, late here. <laughs> this is just an overview. You see how much there is to Mariology? You see how much the church has thought this out over 2,000 years? This isn't like someone going, gee, why would we call Mary Mother of God? Okay, as if we don't have any other thought to it, right? There's a lot. Every, I could spend three hours or a full class on just one of these things I mentioned tonight because each of them are a whole section of Mariology. So the last thing I want to mention here is Marian devotion itself. Um, when I was living down in Tennessee, I got asked the question, why do Catholics worship Mary? Well, we don't worship Mary. As Catholics, we're able to make distinctions in the type of worship and honor we give to God and the saints. Because we've thought this through over 2,000 years. We, we don't just kind of make up it as we go along. So we call adoration, praise, worship that's given to God and God alone, latria, L-A-T-R-I-A, it's latria. That's worship that's given to God and to God alone. We give that to nobody else. And so forth. That's the worship of God as God. The first commandment is latria. But then we have something called dulia. D-U-L-I-A. Dulia. Dulia is a word that means the veneration of the saints. It's honoring them. We honor the saints, these men and women who lived heroic lives of virtue, whom we can imitate, who show us the way to God, who had faults and failures, and, but yet overcame them through God's grace and persevered towards holiness. We honor them. And we can ask them for prayers because we believe them to be in the glory of the kingdom of heaven. So we have dulia. We, we offer them our prayers. We offer them our thanks for their, for their interceding for us. We don't worship them as gods. We don't see them as gods. We don't adore them as gods. But we truly humanly adore them as kind of the way we adore each other. You know, they're <laughs> just great people who did wonderful things. And now in the glory of the kingdom of heaven, who can intercede for us and who love us from heaven too. Because the church exists on earth in purgatory and in heaven. Our brothers and sisters in heaven can intercede for us because they're so close to the throne of God. And we get this from the book of Revelation, right? The 24 elders around the throne holding bowls of incense, offering the prayers of the people to God. So it's, it's found, in, found in Scripture. But the last one here we call hyperdulia. H-Y-P-E-R dulia. D-U-L-I, hyperdulia. This is the veneration given to Mary and to Mary alone. Hyperdulia. She gets more than just dulia. She doesn't get latria, which we give to God alone. She gets dulia, but she gets hyperdulia. She gets the most because of who she is and what she did and what she does. But it's who she is. She is the daughter of the Most High, his first daughter, that he first loved even before her creation. It's the spouse of the Holy Spirit, whom he loves to this day as his bride, who he wed himself to, whom he will never divorce and will always work through. And she is the mother of God, whom he loves with a son's love. No, no human person, no creature ever loved God as she did. No creature could ever. And so she receives a hypodulia. But she's also our mother. And in right of the fourth commandment, we give her hypodulia. We give her obedience. We give her reverence. We give her honor because the fourth commandment tells us to. She gets more than just what the saints get because of who she is to God who she is to us. Just looking at one thing she may have done for the human redemption would be enough to give right to her. A very yes to God becoming man would be enough, never to mention everything else that she did, which was a lot. So, uh, I threw a lot at you tonight. <laughs> I covered the basic generalities of Mariology, real generalities of Mariology. 
and hope we can dive a little bit more into it. I'll end with a very, um, one of my favorite little quotes by Lawrence, St. Lawrence of Brindisi. St. Lawrence of Brindisi is a doctor of the church because of his Mariology. Um, he has this beautiful saying, he says, you know, when a young man falls in love with a woman, she nearly needs to look at him and she renders him powerless. He'll do whatever she wants. He says that the Holy Spirit is so in love with Our Lady that all she needs to do is look at him and she renders him powerless. He'll do whatever she wants because he's so in love with her. I think it's beautiful when you think about Our Lady in that type of relationship with the Holy Spirit as spouse. When you look at a relationship with God the Father as his beloved daughter who can go and crawl up on his lap, daddy's little girl, and ask her for anything and he'll do it. But also the mother of the son, that he so loves his mother that he will do whatever she asks because it's his mom. And he's the one who told her to ask what would be done for her. And to think finally of her relationship to us how she is such a mother to us and how much she loves us as a mother. All that she suffered to give us birth. And when you moms remember how many hours you were in labor for each of your children. <laughs> Our Lady uh, gave birth to us on Calvary. The greatest suffering, the greatest labor pains ever in humanity. In giving birth to the church, to each of us in the order of grace. So with that, we'll shut the camera off, take some questions, and take it from there. Goodbye, folks at home. <coughs>